G'day folks. Talk to Michael Crafter, a pioneer in the Australian metalcore scene, vocalist for Confession, and previously where it all started on the mic for I Killed the Prong Queen, then Carpathian, Bury Your Dead, talking about the mechanics, the foundation where it all starts as a band, what that looks like, what it feels like, touring with four other individuals, sharing the stage at two of us, the hotels, nationally, internationally, the growth and the trajectory. How do you handle that as a band, but as a business too? How does all that work with recording, touring, venues, merch? A lot goes into it, and the emotions, the highs and the lows, the breakups, the effects and influence on people, what music means, and where we jump into some dark places too. Talking about consequences, death, disability, suicide, the black dog, that cloud over your head, it's real. And talking about it, and that ain't always easy. And about his appearance on Big Brother, once upon a time. Yeah, he's a character and a businessman owning and running barber and tattoo shops. No mucking around. Really thoroughly enjoyed that yarn. Solid dude. And if you like the podcast, hit that subscribe or follow button. And we've also got a Patreon page. The link is within the description. So if you want to roll with the squad and become a patron, that'd be great. And want to thank our sponsors. Permobil Australia, the greatest electric wheelchairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four wheels right here. And they've got great assistive tech also. So righto, let's get into it. Michael Crafter, or do we do we go by Crafter brother or? Yeah, we can go by Crafter. That works. Crafter, right, right brothers. Well, you know, thanks for jumping on board and having a yarn and chat with us about yourself, your journey, and which has been, you know, sounds like a hell of a ride from a young fellow to where you are today. So, so thanks for jumping on board. Ah, glad to have a chat. It's always good. Awesome. Man, and it's um, what a journey, hey! Like I remember, like the first taste of I killed the prom queen years ago, and this is like you know, we're twenty twenty three, so that's twenty years ago. Goodbye means forever. When you got yourself and JJ and Jonah, and I know that you guys, you know, ran through a bit of it to a last year but we confession but like has there been any any thoughts with I killed the prom queen sort of up in the air any any balls or and we can get that to to the end of the podcast too but if you want to leave some juice there but no we we all talk like but we all talk individually and me and Jonah probably talk the most and We've definitely had offers and we've definitely talked about it, but it's just getting everyone on the same page, same time. It's just we've all got such different lives nowadays. Yeah. And it makes it, uh, you know, with life, it's like when you've got kids involved, Jonah's got two kids, I've got a daughter, we've got businesses, JJ still tours, Kev has a, a life of his own. It's it's not as simple these days to go, let's just go on tour. Because when you've got real life commitments, just going on tour and collecting Centrelink <laughs> isn't isn't quite the option. <laughs> no, nah, I'm hearing that like well that's it. You gotta be like you're saying, these are all pretty busy and living in different parts of not just Australia but different parts of the globe and you know you got to be pretty strategic about this shit and just making sure that like in yeah it's fun and all that sort of stuff but it's got to be feasible and at the end of the day it's you know dollars in that are coming back in your pockets when you got you know kids and families to support and all that stuff hey mm. and 
Jonah's got two real little kids as well, and JJ's got two little kids, but JJ's kids are on the other side of the world. He's in Australia. Um, Dee's nuts are still doing stuff. It's it's a lot to talk about and to juggle, and I wish we were in our 20s when we could just go, we're going to get in the van and go to Byron Bay or go to Queensland or whatever. But nowadays, it's it's a real strategic, there leads to be a lot of strategy. And also, we've gone through a lot. Like, we're very different people now than we were 20 years ago. And we've also got 20 years of or also somewhat conflict between us and issues and that maybe some of it's not been forgotten. So it, it, takes, it, takes, it takes time, but you're talking... We've been friends, me, JJ, and Jonah, since we were 14 years old. So, like, it... it That's a lot of history together. Yeah, like, we're little kids. And we're, we started bands together with this thing of playing a random show here and there. And literally within a couple of years, we were touring America. It's fucking... Crazy, crazy even think about. That's wild, you know, going from kids. And so Adelaide, where it all started, right? South Australia. So before you were friends, like when you're talking about that style of music and, you know, personally that's, you know, my first choice, love it. i am got varied type of music taste, but my go-to is on hardcore punk and metal. Love this shit. And... um but when you're talking about influences, like coming out of SA and just like what you're hearing in Australia and overseas, like what were your influences? But also you, your choice, like you're a vocalist, but did you pick up a guitar first or did you grab like any other instruments or was it straight for the mic or what was the go? No, I played bass in a punk band for a little bit of time and then I was in oh I think we 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 all got put into a class for being fucking shit house and not not listening. So I remember I was sitting there and Jonah turned around and he goes, I'm starting a band, do you wanna sing in it? And I was like, sure. Because we were both we were both straight edge at the time. We were both into very similar stuff. And, like, JJ and Jonah and stuff were uh, kind of, like, really into corn and silver chair kind of bands and a lot more uh, and some a lot more new metal stuff where I was listening to, like, Earth Crisis and Strife and then a lot of punk bands like Pennywise, No Effects. Um, and then... Then we kind of collectively started to find bands more so in Adelaide and started going to shows. And what did that mean to you? Like, because I take a lot from, like, when you're looking at not just the bands and that style of music and what comes out of it, but especially, like, when you're tapping into, like, if it's hardcore and Pennywise and their lyrics and the meaning that comes out of that. You know, like, did you take a, a lot of that on board as well? I think I didn't get uh, too caught up in what ly- lyrics and political meaning anything had until Strife and Earth Crisis kind of came along and there were these songs about straight edge and um, veganism and stuff like that. And I, I went vegan at the time. So Back then? I was like, actually, yeah, I did for a long time. So I was vegan for from 16 till well, I was still in prom queen till probably about 2005. Yeah, right. And can you explain to listeners and viewers what straight edge is and what it means? Yeah, so when I when I was younger, there was a lot of bands that were straight edge bands, and they basically uh, didn't drink, didn't didn't take drugs, didn't smoke. Etc. And I seen seen uh, as, as a child growing up around a pub because my mum was a pub a pub manager. I seen the alcoholism problems, but like we just with people there. And in a small football town, 
you see how people are. And I was like, well, that's not what I want. I, I, I drank and stuff when I was real little, but both of you talking, I was drinking when I was 14, 15 years old. Mm. And by the time I was 16, I was like, I don't want this. And even to like, I, I don't drink. I'm still straight edge and it's been majority of my life. That is huge. Like, you know, because I know how I grew up. Like, and when you're looking at Australian culture in general, drinking and youngsters, like to make that decision at a 16 year old, at, at 16 years of age is massive, you know. Yeah, and but you know, you know, well, when I was uh, 16, 17, there was a few uh, things that happened within to my friends around me that kind of made me stay and think the path I was taking was probably for the best because um, my friend Ryan was and like a bunch of my mates and I was meant to go with them and they had a car crash. They ne- nearly all died. He ended up being a quadriplegic and it's like one of my best mates. So when I knew like it was like drugs, alcohol and whatnot was a big part of the culture of young people surfing and football and whatever else, I was like, well, maybe this whole decision to not drink and not do drugs and whatever else is for me because I've seen such damage caused to like one of my friends ending up as a quadriplegic, but then the damage to like, uh, I guess emotional damage to all of us around him because one of our, one of our best friends had ended up ending in a wheelchair. And then, uh, yeah, it was just a massive thing. And then a few, probably like a year later, um, another friend, another friend that was in the football side, he had a car crash and a bunch of people died in the crash and stuff like that. And I was like, the country, and that, this was like mm. happening a lot in the country. People were drinking and driving, taking drugs and driving, maybe, maybe too stoned and driving. Like we were doing all of it when we were real young, like 15, 16, 14, 15, 16 years old. Yeah, I'm hearing you. Sorry. And then by the time you get to a little bit older, you go, Oh well, maybe this path that I've picked and cho- chosen to be is probably for the best because I've avoided um, and like like friend, seeing friends with very bad drug problems. Yeah, like you watch watch your mates at school go from smoking weed with you, going out for a few drinks and stuff, and the next minute you hear like they're on the needle and they're into heroin and stuff like that and like that was just the that was just con- the country and it's still the same it's just different drugs you know like they still have these problems like still have like even where my mum lives there's still pretty often like car accidents probably involving drinking mm. and stuff like that so it's just the the things that happened around me and the life that was I was kind of brought up around made me make the decisions that I've made. A lot of strength in that, a lot of perseverance. And I'm glad you bring that up in regards to, like, your mates, the quad. And, you know, I can obviously relate to that. I'm a C5, C6 yeah. quadriplegic. And just where it's, yes, that affects a, that individual, but just the ripple effect, how it affects friends, family, everybody in between. And, you know, yeah, it sucks that, you know, the young fella ended up in a chair and being a quad, but how that's affected people around him and making the right choices and not getting on the gear or drinking or whatever and driving and accidents and all that sort of shit because, man, like the spinal cord rehabilitation centres are full year-round, you know, from people. Yeah, it's nuts. And when, you know, stuff does get involved with grog and just – decisions that you know are not the greatest and end up putting yourself in a predicament which you know leads to a life of being in a chair and having a disability and um and then life can either go one way or the next and depression all of it bud so yeah yeah so i'm glad you bring that up i i I remember going to the center in the north of adelaide and we were 16 year old kids you know and our whole life had 
like we we've been in a class together since we're in primary school, and then our whole lives have just seemed like they changed overnight because this friend of ours that we were riding BMX with, going surfing with, playing footy with, all these things, his whole life has changed ever since then, and it's it's such a crazy thing to happen when you're 16 years old. And you're kind of living this like fun, free life. Like we were going to see punk bands all the time. There was always music going, and we we're doing all of it. You know, going to everything we could. And then this kind of happened, and I felt like it was such a big fucking moment for all of us and a, a country town and a country school and a country footy club. Um. Yeah, it was it was just a massive impact. Yeah, hundred percent. So, I hope he's mate still got those wheels moving forward. So, oh, mate, he he ended up doing um, wheelchair rugby for Australia, and he's won like gold medals and everything. Hey, uh, get after so, it, son. <laughs> yeah, no. Nah, so he ended up doing that for oh, oh, probably I reckon. 15 plus years of doing that like between competitions going to the olympics and stuff like that so he's paralympics and- mate paralympics <laughs> mate, oh yeah the, so but it's all good all good up, yeah <laughs> but it's like it's a it's a gold medal you know like it's crazy 100 you know? percent. yeah like, i see like a goal like i'm pretty sure he ended up with like a gold a bronze and went to multiple para- paralympics um Still the Olympics. Yeah. Still the <laughs> Do you know what the funny thing is too? When you're watching these fellas, like you know, Jansen, you know, you got ladies involved too. Like I've had a crack at it, and it's like you've already broken your neck or you got some impairment. It's like fuck. Do you want to get? You want to break your neck again? Like it's full of hot. Oh, man, I I went out there a few times <laughs> and did it, and I just got hurt. <laughs> you end up on the floor because. The, they know how to knock you over so easily. Yeah, right. And it's like, just get rammed and you're on your fucking head. Yeah. Like, just fucking hurt. 100%. It, I was like, I'm never doing this again. I'm fucking more injured than I was on a footy field. Yeah, see, there you go. No, that's awesome. Awesome to hear. So, hey, so music scene back in Adelaide, like growing up, like, because I always get intrigued, like, at different scenes around the country. So, what was that like? Because you guys are, you know, a pioneer in a lot of ways. So how was that rolling through, bros? Well, when I was a kid, there was like a fo- uh, like a lot of shows at football clubs. So like there was like local punk bands and, and kind of hardcore bands would play these footy clubs. And what happened was Mind Snare played the Odinga Football Club, which was my hometown. Ah. And that's how I got into hardcore. So they're to blame for it. Um, so they came down there and I seen them. And then from there, I started to learn about local shows. And there was a band called Force Fed Nine. And there was a faster punk hardcore band called Where's the Pope. And then um, I came across a band called Day of Contempt. And how that happened was I was at a show and the drummer and the singer came up and talked to me because I had a straight edge jumper on. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm straight edge, blah, blah. Well, we've been friends ever since. So I was 16 then. And uh, after that, they kind of became the band we all wanted to be. Yeah. That goes for everyone. That, that goes for Parkway. That goes for, a, like, a big amount of the bands coming up at that time. We seen how Day of Contempt were and how they were this like ever evolving touring machine and we wanted it. And and they were the band we all looked up to. That's awesome. One's to blame for so <clears throat> so they're the ones to blame for. So then when you starting out with a band, I always get intrigued too when you're looking at the development of whether it's bass, vocals, drums, everything in between, right? So how was it like, and especially vocals, and where you doing it, and how you doing it? So, 
when you're developing that as a youngster, was it in the bedroom? You got that fucking egg carton stapled to the wall and you're driving mum nuts, she's fucking screaming and shit. We we were practicing either in my la- lounge room, Jonah's mum's shed, or my mate Lyndon's bedroom, which was like a fucking shoebox. But I was also going up to JJ's a lot where he was he was had his band and we'd just stuff around in the shed playing stuff. And and me and JJ used to get extremely stoned. His mum would feed us and then we'd go and play fucking whatever rock like Silver Chair or whatever songs we knew, Pennywise, Blink One Eight Two, just like be the punk rock or like Silver Chair kind of stuff. And then then that's kind of where I ended up singing in a band and we basically just started and I was like, well, I've got to work out how to do this. That's awesome. Just working it out as you go. So, but that's what it's all about, you know? If you don't know, who the fuck starts screaming and goes, oh, I've got this method. There's nothing written on the internet. <laughs> like, fucking belt it out and hope for the best. Back then, you know, Google was only just starting up. So... Oh, literally, it was like you know, was there, and you couldn't find what music you had was on a CD. Like, yeah, hundred percent. Like, you would come round and like LimeWire and uh, Napster and stuff. It all started kicking off, and and my mate Lyndon would have all these bands, and we'd be like mind blown by the shit we we're listening to. <laughs> Bloody LimeWire that and Napster. Got, oh, Napster, they got in some shit. Thanks, Ma- yeah. thanks, Metallica. But anyway, oh, Nap- Napster could have been the Spotify. Yeah, true. You know, if they play their cards right. But anyway, but say screaming up, he's all gelling like he's all bandmates from school, and that's awesome. And very young, but sort of. When did you get to that point when you're like, okay, this is gelling. I think we got something here. I think um, so. Me and Jonah had a couple bands before Prom Queen, and then when when our band broke up, he got offered to be this new band with a bunch of older hardcore dudes. And so him and he he took JJ with him, and they they'd done another like rock silver chair kind of band as well together, and so they'd gone ahead and done this band, and then. At the time, their singer was having some kind of... I, I guess he was getting older and family and whatnot. Like, they were like, do you want to sing? And I was like, sure. And then that's when it became Michael the Brom Queen. Awesome. So, but, right, so you're in. <clears throat> starting, to, starting to practice, starting to gel in. But did you... Apart from jamming, was it jam and jam and jam and then a bit of recording first or it was like let's play some local shows and just put the feelers out and just see what the response is like and, and just see how we go as a unit? No, I think what happened was we did a, a few shows and then we went to, I think, I think we went to Melbourne maybe a couple of times and then Jonah wanted to and move to London for a girl. <laughs> so he's he's, the way. he's gone and Yeah, so we've basically essentially played a handful of shows and we're like, okay, the band's over. So then we've gone so then we've it's probably been two weeks and he's back. He's flown back from London and then we're... Oh, so he did go over. Yeah, yeah, he did go over. So we're mid-recording as well. So we nearly nearly tracked the full first EP. And then I, I remember Jonah had bailed and all the guitars, drums, everything was recorded. So we were like, oh, we'll do the singing parts, like the proper singing parts. So we're all trying... We all can't sing. Like we're all terrible. We all can't hit the notes. We're fucking shocking. So then he comes back. We go to um, record, 
finished the recording, mixed it, released it. Like, pretty short period of time. You're talking, you release the CD then, you fucking, you got a pile of CDs. Yeah, true. And you're taking them on the road. You're not like, you're not putting them into stores. It was like a, be the craziest thing ever to think it's just, like, if you wanted to get your CD into a store, you went to a store with a pile of CDs and went, can you sell these? <laughs> And literally, literally. we were doing. We were going, we were going to stores in Adelaide and putting them on, like giving them to the people and selling them, like fifty here, fifty there, and then like. Well, you got to start. Yeah, and and within, oh, I reckon two weeks, um, sold about five hundred. Nice. Between between us, the stores, and we've done some like. Launch kind of stuff. We went to Melbourne. But before that, was it hard? No, you're right. But was it hard getting into? Okay. Like, was it hard getting into? Um, like just the recording process, like finding the the, the right sort of studio and ha- getting the money behind it to even get it going, and an engineer and mixing and all that sort of stuff. I think it was kind of honestly. I uh, think I reckon we all put in. 200 or 300 bucks each and we paid $1,500 to record. I reckon it was that low. I reckon it was like we did two or three days and then that was that. Like I can't, I can't, I can't think of it being much more than that. Yeah. Okay. And so getting these CDs out, right? So, and you would have been pumped, like especially getting them in the stores and doing a launch. And what was the feeling like, like sort of, EPs and getting the first CDs out and just how does it feel being on stage and just the reception of the crowd, like your hometown crowd? And obviously if you're tapping into Melbourne and just starting there. Well, I think it was it was super exciting to go to Melbourne because when I'd gone to Melbourne in the past, shows were probably like 100, 150 people. And I was like, oh, this is huge. And so then when we started doing our own shows and moving up the kind of bill and stuff because people were coming out, we were kind of thinking, well, we're on to something here because we're doing something new. We're already gaining traction. We're already in Melbourne getting offers to go to Sydney and all this stuff. And it kind of like block, like bit by bit, we built up the blocks, you know, and we were like, Playing in Melbourne more, we went to Sydney for something called a hardcore, which was held by Resist at the time, and then that kind of like also opened to us to a new group of friends, new crowd of people, new and we 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 struggled in Sydney for some time as far as pulling anyone, and then as time went on, it's like we had our own own following and. Crazy to think that you go from this bunch of kids in Aldinga playing in a shed to playing in Sydney and you're playing to three, four hundred people and you're like, this is the craziest show ever. Yeah, that's awesome. And, like, and you know, having 150 people and when you're, you know, back then and starting off, but how does one, you know, because you're trying to figure out, you got the record out, but then you're looking at where we can travel but then how does one tap into that where you sort of look like ringing up a record label and going, well, hey, we're looking at trying, how do we do this? Like, how do we travel? How do we get that venue? How do we get slotted into the bill? Like, was, would you just leave that to someone else, whether that was with the record label or is, would you just wing it or what was the go? It, it was me and Jonah. And the way a lot of stuff worked was, there was guest books and message boards and, and we'd chat to people through there and we'd also check on MSN. So we would talk to people in different bands. Or oh, MSN Messenger. <laughs> yeah. And like at the time we were playing with like Portal Common, uh, Gyroscope, Kiss Chasey, um, I'm trying to think more early earlier kind of bands were going to Melbourne. Um, but like we were playing with everything that was diverse. Like it wasn't, it wasn't as clean cut as us going to play with hardcore bands because we didn't see that completely in the, 
genre that we were. We thought we could play across multiple genres and play to different different crowds because we felt if we can get five people from this crowd, this crowd, this crowd, and all these shows we play, well, there's a chance we'll get a bigger like a bigger following. It worked. It did work. Yeah, and then did that lead to start? It's like right, you've gone mainstream. So then it's like okay, well now we, we've travelled a bit, and we know some local hardcore bands, as in local Australian hardcore bands from around the way. So let's now play with the same style of music and just see what where we can build momentum. Because fuck, man, you guys blew up like when you really started touring and like I've got a a memory um it's funny because my parents lived like 150 meters from the Wong Oasis Youth Centre right I could hear, yeah. I could hear the shit playing when I'd be at home right and I remember it was a, it must have been maybe 2007 I think and it, it was you guys and then the support were like, bring me the horizon and some of the other. Yeah, 2008. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, yeah. that was fucking wild, you know? Yeah. It's insane. Like, that's the thing. Like, the fact that, like, those little small areas had such big shows, and that's kind of us and Parkway had that mindset from the get-go where the smaller towns were also a key factor to build the bands for the future. Because there was kids everywhere, and it was like there was this this wave of heavy, heavy music, punk rock, and all these genres into these towns, and kids didn't have anything else to do, so they were drawn to it. It was great, hundred percent. Yeah, that, that's awesome that you bring that up too, like playing, re- and that means a lot, man. Like when you see it, because I knew what it felt like, because a lot of bands were either coming and playing it while at the time and a lot of you know i was seeing bleeding through there parkway you know and that was only bloody 150 meters up from my parents house which was awesome but and just seeing like the environment you know how that had affected a lot of the kids in the air and then all the local bands around the central coast that would start spawning up like my brother-in-law like even off the back has seen a lot of you guys playing there he ended up starting a band plus you know, he was listening to a lot of shit I was listening to, plus I used to play guitar. And, um, like, you, major influence, you know, the Australian hardcore scene, that's for sure. So, and um, just want to say thank you for that because it does mean a lot, brother. No, it's it's a cool thing to think that, like, I can go to places still and play shows and people can have those stories and and tell me you know like it's like we did sydney last year and the stories people say even about playing a couple of prom queen songs brought back all these memories for people they're like i seen you when i was 14 i seen you when i was this and for us it's like we were still very young we were like early 20s kevin cameron when he joined the band was 16 years old and we were he was 17 and we're touring america like it's pretty crazy. Like, he'd only just turned 16, and we were playing Melbourne nightclubs, and this kid wasn't even allowed in. <laughs> he'd have to literally wait in the van, literally put his guitar on, walk on stage, play, and then go off. And we, we'd, like, fucking... Like some some venues would be a hassle. We're like, okay, we can't play. If he doesn't play, we don't play. Yeah, you just put the ball in the air court. Yeah, and how he even joined the band was like, when I was like, I messaged him and he goes, oh, you're my favourite band and I'm 16 years old. I was like, fuck, can we do a band with a kid when we're like 20 years old or 21, 22? And we were like, I said to Jonah and stuff at the time, I was like, this kid's insane. I said, what he plays like, what he looks like on stage, and everything. I said that we're 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 he's in. Like he's we've got to do this. And then he joined the band, and it was like chaos. Like <laughs> I used to look over. It's like this sixteen-year-old kid throwing the guitar around his head, and like the neck's broken off, and 
he's bleeding like and i'm like i, I was like his parents are gonna fucking like like put, take us to court for a, his kid hurting their kid hurting himself all the time and not just hurting himself he's doing it in bloody nightclubs <laughs> oh yeah i used to i used to go to the parents house before tours and be like everything's gonna be okay and they were like the coolest ever like they're still fucking legends. I, 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 I like, like, lucky enough got to see him not long ago, and I was just like, such like great parents to him. And and Kev was always a strange kid, so he was this kind of introvert. But as soon as he put his guitar on, he's just a psycho. <laughs> Man, it's funny what music can do to people, you know. So, mate, <clears throat> so I, I kill the prom queen. Prom queen, so like well, when it all because you've been, and we'll just go through some of the stages. Like, so I killed so prom queen, right? So when you left, so was that just at the time? Was it just indifferences? It was a hostile, was it an amicable thing? It's just you sort of at that age, you're sort of over it. Like, was it a bit of the like, where were the emotions? Where was that all heading, brother? Um. I remember we were battling a lot when we recorded and I wasn't really as into it as they obviously were and I kind of worried about other stuff a lot more. And at the time, I'd been going to Byron more and more and I was around the Parkway dudes all the time. And at the time, I think members of Prom Queen started to feel Parkway as a real threat. And because I'd helped, helped them up and gave them a first tours out releases took them out on the road and stuff like that I, f- I feel like because we were like the like this like parkway started to go like this you know and and prom queen maybe felt a little bit left behind but i'm one of those people that's like high tide raises all ships if they get bigger we're going too, mm, like hundred percent, and vice versa. And after that, it kind of was the the the, the bands kind of drifted, even as far as friendships go. But I have always stayed close with Parkway, and then when I was out, like, but obviously going through stages of where I didn't agree on stuff, they didn't agree on stuff, and we were battling. Like me, Jonah, JJ, Sean, and Kev, and it's hard because you're like it's like you're friends, but it's it's you know it is it can become a job too because when you earn a dollars and cents, it's working that shit out. Yeah, and you're talking. I always say it's like having another girlfriend, mm. like because I bet you, but you're dealing with four, div, four or five, or how many people are in your band relationships within a relationship you have with the band itself. Um, so I, I had a lot of detachment. And when I got kicked out, I was obviously, and that was kicked out. Straight up. That was the situation. It's like, dude, you, yeah, that, dude, you got to go. Yeah. So it wasn't even that. It was like, you're out. Oh, shit. And I was like, okay. I was like, okay, well, what's next? Got obviously pretty depressed for a bit. Um, just because of financially, I'd all everything I'd ever done was around that band, um, and although it was only a few years in, I then ended up chatting with Marty, who was in Carpathia at the time, and he's like, "Why don't you sing and I'll play guitar?" And I was like, "I'm in," and then that's how I ended up in Carpathia. Right, and that was like not you weren't in there for. So- not too long. Hey, but did you end up playing? Because I saw them in, um, when they were supporting a tray you come out and they're at the roundhouse. It was, yeah. Hold on. A tray you and 36 Crazy Fish. Were you on that tour, brother? Yeah. yeah I, I sung that tour. Oh, fuck. Well, that, yeah, I thought so because yeah. I remember being in the crowd. I'm like, righto. That's him up there now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that was, um, hang on. Sorry. Yeah. All right, yeah. Right. Fine. Um, yeah, so that was the first kind of big tour I'd done, like as far as with them. And we were like... That was an awesome show too. Yeah, a pretty buzz band at the time. And there was someone playing over us. And I remember the tour manager talking to us, like, because we were 
fucking hassle. <laughs> but they were young. Like, Marty was pretty young, and we just, like, didn't take anything seriously. And then we were, like, obviously doing real well. But we were selling more merch than everyone besides Atreyu on the tour. Really? Cause, yeah, because we, we were selling fucking heaps. And then, um, so then after the tour, that's kind of like when that band kind of went like that as well. Right. So, and with some of those contacts, like, and, you know, that's pretty big. Like, and they're, like, at the time, too, Atreyu a you were massive. And 36 Crazy Fist have been around for a while, band from Alaska. And um, so, bury your dead. So, he, like, how did that opportunity sort of pop up? Did you just see an email one day or they rang you up and said, mate, love your stuff, get your ass over to the States, let's give it a run? Well, I'd never, ever met any of them. I didn't know any of them. We didn't have. We had one mutual friend who now plays in Bury Your Dead. And um, he must have said something to them about me. Because I was, I was at Win Winston's house, and Winston, at Winston's parents' house. And he was in a room, and I was in a room. Because we'd sit on MSN on fucking computers. <laughs> like, literally, I don't know. Heaps Kids like, wouldn't get it these days. Yeah, and he, he comes in and he's like, Bury Your Dead have like, the vocalist has left and I was like that's insane they're huge at the moment and then um, I I think it was a couple of hours later I checked my email and it was from the band and they were like hey we want you to send a, a demo and I was like yeah sure so I flew back to Melbourne me and D.W. Norton, who was in the band Super Heist, we tracked it, and then I sent it off. And I remember I was on tour with Carpathian on a headliner in Perth at the time as well. And I remember I walked from my mate's house to this distinct payphone, which is next to a Bunnings, and it's still there. It's, uh, every time I go past this Bunnings, I think of the, the conversation. And I, like, remember calling, and I was like, hey, talking, and they're like, yeah, you need to fly out here. And I was like, when? And they're like, two weeks. And I was like, okay. And I remember... Did they pay for it? Did they fly you out? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then I remember going back to the house, and we are on tour. It was us. I actually uploaded the... the fly yesterday it was called the rampage tour oh yeah 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 and, and um so it was all around that time and then i went to back to this house where my friend Maud, who is a big he's a tour manager uh was in a big band called break even or big hardcore band called break it break even um and we all kind of sat down and we're talking shit and i was like i've i've got to quit and everyone's like what and i was like i'm going to sing for bury your dead and everyone's like what the fuck everyone's like like everyone's like mind blown because even david drummed in carpathian it's like his favorite band at the time and i was like how yeah, they feel and i was <laughs> oh well, both so of it, all of this everyone was like what the fuck like it was such a big deal and then I went, I remember, did a couple last Melbourne shows and then I was off. Like, and then my, they went back to having Marty sing. Fuck. Ah, right. Yeah, right. So, and, and what was the, like, you go over there, you try out, but, because that's, like, it's a massive, even though we speak the same language, English, but culturally, like, they're so different. And how'd it go living and sort of trying to fit in over there? Well, it was lucky because they were living in, a few of them were living in Jacksonville in Florida, which I'd been to a lot because of Evergreen Terrace and stuff like that. Yep. So I spent a lot of my time there. So as soon as I landed, the band picked me up, but I also had friends in that town, so I had plenty of people to catch up with. It was kind of like not that weird for me because I'd been there for six months at a time or three months at a time or whatever, it was always kind of like our home base from Prom Queen, 
when we're in in America because we come home for like a couple weeks back to there and then go back out on tour. So I'd been there a lot, and then so culturally I knew what to expect, like pretty redneck and pretty Florida. Like you want to go, like if you want to go do something on the weekend, you're going to shoot something with with a machine gun, or you're driving around in a fucking truck through mud puddles. Like that's their idea of fun. So it wasn't like a huge change for me. I just got to be around friends and hopefully have a success with this band. That's awesome. Florida, hey? Fucking anything goes there. <laughs> anything. It's crazy. They're still running Confederate flags on fucking oh, flags God. in front of houses and shit back at that point. It was insanity. That's nuts, man. Yeah, that's a old Trump. He lives down that way. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. So, yeah, going through and just so how did it feel because obviously and like with the time spent with that band and traveling to her and, and just trying to get in the mix of it culturally because, you know, you got family and like everything sort of back home. So how's how was that all sort of panning out before? Because obviously you come back for other reasons why, but, you know, when you got confession and we'll get back, get on to that but just talk to us about bury your dead and just the length of the, that period and sort of the decision that you come to i i think i was probably there for a few months before the tour and then i remember jamming a fucking heap and it was it sounded fucking huge but what was weird for me i loved the band i would never seen the band the only time I'd ever seen them was on DVD. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm in band practice, and there's all these dudes around me who have been in, like, fucking between the buried and me. Blood has been shed with Howard Jones. Um, well, I'm trying to think what other... But there's a, a bunch of other fucking bands. So I'm looking at all these dudes who I've seen on DVDs and shit, sing these songs and act like I'm in this band. So was that intimidating? Like, yeah, and I felt like I had, it was full imposter syndrome. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, I felt like I wasn't near worthy of the situation that I was in. So I never quite felt comfortable. And as time went on, I felt less and less comfortable. And I was just like, this isn't the right fit for me. Like, I sound good in this band. This is what they want. This is the sound they want. I probably had the MySpace following, whatever else at the time. I was out of Prom Queen, which was a huge MySpace kind of band at the time. Mm. And But it wasn't feeling right for me. And also, uh, mentally, Prom Queen was at a crossroads where it was breaking up. I, I, know, I started to really feel it because I was like, that's my fucking band. Like, for me, I was, like, still had such an emotional attachment to it. So that was kind of the first time I'd actually, like, started reaching back out to Kev, Jonah, JJ and Sean and talking about stuff. And we'd even started to, like, brainstorm like, maybe doing Prom Queen Tour as a final tour. Yeah, right. And and that, that kind of panned out that way. So it was kind of like... As Barry Dead was sick shows and big shows and like some stuff we played was crazy. It just didn't feel didn't feel right for me. No, fair enough. So didn't feel and that's being honest with yourself, bro. Probably you know. So and um, coming back home. So if we're sort of going to keep moving ahead and we look at confession and this is a new like you still got I kill the prom queen and that's you know foundation. That's your baby. But now you got the birth of your – it's almost – you wouldn't say rebirth, but it's like, you know, it's like a second win and where you've got confession and but it's from, you know, I'm just a listener and and from my perspective, it's, you know, it's, it's yours and it's, you know, driven by you and trying to formulate that. But before we just jump into confession, so if you're looking at some of the bands like – or where you've been involved with I Killed the Prom Queen. 
Barry your dad, Carl Pathian. So is there like a memory, a wild memory that sort of really stands out, like whether it was crowd-related, band-related, on-the-road related? Oh, um, Barry your dad taking gun- guns on tour was a, it's always going to fucking stick to me. Like, you're talking okay, fucking, everyone's got a handgun. There's fucking pump action shotguns in bags. Like, I felt like we were NWA going out on the road. Like, you, that scene in, in, um, the, uh, what's that? Welcome to Compton or whatever that movie. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Where they're like pulling guns out and whatever. That was my life. <laughs> that was every day. Like, there were times where, like, I really felt like we were going to get into fucking shoot. Like, that was well, not me. I wasn't shooting at people. But I was like, there's a high chance they're going to get into a shootout. Okay, no, man. Americans, they're off top, eh? Still crazy. Still think about the guns in bags and shit. Like, putting guns in their guitar cases. Fuck, Crazy. it's weird how normalised that is. But, um, yeah, so with Confession coming back here, so, like, because you're pretty established by then, you're coming back right, bud, and then you're looking at, okay, well, starting something up. So is it just reaching out to different people in different areas that you already know and it's like, hey, guys, I think I've got something here. Do you just want to? Do you just want to buy in, tap in, I think, you know, because I want to really give this a crack? Mm. I, so the, I, I had a friend called Adam and uh, we jammed with a bunch of drummers and then Dan was, so we jammed a bit actually. And the first jam was uh, me, Adam, I can't remember who drummed. Uh, Luke, Luke from Sunk Lodo played guitar. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and a, and a few other people. And, but that didn't work. It just wasn't the sound we wanted. The jam didn't go anywhere. The songs weren't there. And then I messaged Dan, who's now in the Amity Affliction, and went, oh, I've got this idea, and this is what I want to sound like. And then he sent back songs, and that was the first songs that kind of ended up online. Yeah, okay. And he's kicked off. So, and that was all. Well, it's just all on computer, too. And that's why, like, how we started that is kind of like how I feel Confession is now. I've got songs to release. Just haven't released them. Ah. Oh, fuck, he's got some. So, man. Juice, eh? Man, man, Dan, still talk about recording stuff. We have recorded stuff. I just haven't. I haven't got around to releasing it, and when I do, I do. Hey, we'll get back to that stuff in a minute, but I just want to throw this in the mix. This bloody Big Brother stuff, I remember watching it. How the fuck did that come about? I um, I ran into Stu Harvey before a Friends or Rom show in Melbourne one night, and he goes, there's a voting system for Big Brother you should go home and do a video and, and and get everyone to vote. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. So I've gone home and I'm like, my name's Crafter. I play in this band. I t- I'm a touring musician. I'm friends with Winston from Parkway Drive. <laughs> and just joked around and then put it online. And I remember there was like a top 10 front page of this Big Brother site. Well, by like 9 a.m., I was at the top, <laughs> and and I and everyone hadn't even started sharing shit yet. Yeah, crafter. <laughs> like I, all I did was post it on my MySpace at the time. Go vote for me. Posted the link, and I looked at the I looked at the fucking um, numbers, and I had like thousands. I found thousands of votes. <laughs> Next day, Parkway, fucking. Um, I'm trying to think who was around at the time. Bury Your Dead, Prom Queen, all the bands posting all this shit to vote for me. Then, like, Hilltop Hoods posted it. Like, all the... Oh, your local SA, SA brothers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, All the Adelaide bands were posting it, and I didn't even know half of them. And I was like, this is nuts. And it was all on MySpace. And then I remember the first fucking thing I went into, like, so there's probably 200 
possible contestants at this fucking thing. And like they've flown. They, no, no, this one was in Melbourne. So I've gone, gone to the thing. They've pulled me in. For some reason, they've asked me to get interviewed first in front of all these people. Oh. And I'm like, they're like, Paddle. why do you think? Yeah, yeah. And with the crowd as well. Oh, shit. And yeah, like, right. Yeah, with all the other contestants. And I was like, they're like, why do you think you're going to be on Big Brother? And I said, well, by looking at all these other losers, I'm getting, I'm, I'm leading the votes by so much. Just call me when you need me to walk into the house. And then so your your confidence there. your confidence is fucking up here through the through the roof. Done. So I've walked out the room, and then this like producer person or whatever follows me, and they're like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "Just call me when you need me. I don't I don't need to be I don't need to be at this." And they're like, "Oh." And then I walked off, and I got a phone call that night, and they're like, "You're going to be difficult, aren't you?" And I said. Well, I don't really need to get on the show. I thought it was funny. It's gone further than I needed it to already. <laughs> like, like, all I wanted to do was do it and make an advert for it and put it on my MySpace and think it was funny. But, well, this joke started getting out of hand. And then next, I'm fucking doing photos. And then when they've actually told me the date I've got to go into the house, I was like, I can't go. And they're like, why? I was like, I've got band practice this day. I've got this on this. I was like, Prom Queen's got a big tour coming up. When the tour's on, I've got to be in the house. So what can you do? Well, they offered me a pretty good amount of money to go in. And then I went in later than everyone else. And yep. I lasted five days and made a pretty obscene amount of money for five days and thanks for coming a week before, <laughs> yeah, a week before that and i left the house and flew straight to adelaide to go to band practice and was on two or three days later fucking hell hey it was funny how like even within mainstream media like how many people ended up knowing who these crafty character is but hey and then it's opened it up to Oh well, now there's more followers coming through on the hardcore scene. It's like they tap in, you know, tap in through MySpace. Oh, Tom's your first friend. Oh, now let's see what's going on. Okay, yeah. now. Yeah, I, I feel like that that time, like even when I walked into the house, someone's like, "I know you. I've got tickets to go see your band." Yeah, right. Like, like I was getting walking into the house and I. I was known by people in the house. I was like, <laughs> fuck them. Like, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy to think. Uh, that's awesome. Hey, so jumping back on the music train, confession, name, where did it come from and what does it mean here? I felt like because I wanted to have a pretty strong anti-religious stance as far as the way the lyrics were, the how outspoken I'd be and so forth. I felt like the term confession was fitting because it's a part of religion. Mm. And I feel like it's it's such a strong thing where they're like for them to go and confess and reveal their problems and confess their sins and whatever. It's like, well I'm gonna take the fucking piss out of this. Yeah. Right. And I did. I did. You sure did. Uh, but, hey, man, when you're looking at a lot of this stuff that's in the media, George Pell and all the rest of the shit, like, you know, like, it's fuck, it is full on. But, um, no, but the thing is it su suits you, brother, and, like, the band itself. But the mission that, like, starting Confession and when it's, like, you know, the music style of recording and touring, is it this still the same and you know COVID and all the bullshit is it the same mission today like when that start uh, and when you're looking at 2020 and just want to say that's a sick tune 2020 and i love the like yes the instruments vocals but the program and that goes into that tune as well oh we um uh, i was gonna grab my charger yeah you're right yeah um, yeah no nah, i so we the guy that does did all the um where's the power cord um 
the guy that did the backing stuff, like which is the full production or, or orchestral orchestral stuff, um, does a lot of movies ah. and shit for like the Architects, Amity, and all these bands. So, sorry, I'm just all over the place. Um, and does that flip? There, does that flip? there we go. Okay, that's wait. Up. I just gotta prop prop this up something or or hold it. Stand, hold it. Um, but, it's all good. Stand yeah, by. I'll be able to get. Yeah, you're all right. Keep going. Yeah, no. Nah, so he he does a bunch of stuff. Dan obviously did the rest of it. We we're bored in COVID, so we wrote some songs and then. Um, but yeah, the other dude does some pretty wild stuff. Yeah, and looking forward to the juice. But hey, what it's up because you know I wanted to touch on this because of just the post that I saw yesterday. So, you know, it's been full over the years from old mate from the Red Shore, what the ghost inside have gone through, and um, yeah, and then when you still see like the drummer in the get from the ghost inside, like where. Uh, you know, and what he's achieved, and even with his disability, which is love it, awesome. And then you're looking at the guitarist from Polaris that passed away. Like it's um, a lot's been going on in the heavy music scene over the last couple of years, brother. Hey, eh? whether it's the black, yeah. whether it's the black, and even a part like with yourself, like with your band, and you know the fucking black dog's real, man. Like, yeah. But well, that's the thing. Like, I felt like there's always going to be this issue where, whether it's at the heights of a band or the lows of a band, people's mental health issues will struggle. And I often wonder whether the the party lifestyle that comes with it, the drinking, maybe the drugs, the fucking, the ups and downs of it also will take its toll. I know at the lows for me, I was very fucking i was struggling but i didn't have that i guess liquid courage or whatever of drinking or drugs to really numb the pain so i dealt with the pain head on and i was able to get through a lot of my problems and the loss of friends family uh bands bands coming and going and so forth but i feel like maybe if someone has a bit more of a drinking problem or a drug problem or whatever else, maybe maybe their stability is and their, the serotonin levels in general mm. are on such a rocky fucking path that they can't think to pull themselves out of the the, the dark days, you know? So th- they can't see that the, there's better stuff ahead, the future's going to be brighter and they couldn't be even more of a success than they'll ever be. And... I struggled like that with Sean. I struggled to talk to him about work and jobs and so forth. I because he didn't see that there was so much better ahead. But for some people, they're in so much pain they feel like they've got no other option. Is it hard when you you got someone close to you like that? And it's because sometimes you're looking at someone on face value, and of you know it's and there's someone that. I know, and that I used to, you know, go to gigs and stuff, and you know, you'd see him there, and and like an acquaintance, like a mate, and you just seeing them, and life looks fine and dandy, and you know, having fun at fucking Parkway shows, you know, every time I die or other bands like that, and you think everything's sweet, and then the next thing, it's like bang, they're gone, and it's like man, like when people are just, you know, internalizing everything and. Where they're not talking, you know, it's um, yeah, it's a hard one, that's for sure. I think um, by by hearing about um, certain people in bands and, and and their struggles, I feel like a lot of people have very similar um kind of paths leading up to it. Like there there is a lot of detachment and stuff, and this is. I don't, I I don't know. Um, like I didn't know the guy from Black Dahlia. I I, I didn't know know the young kid from Polaris. Like I know a few of those guys, but I don't know his story either. For me, with Sean and my friend Hoppo, who was in 
miles away and whatever. They had a lot of other hidden battles that people probably didn't know about. And no matter what was said to them or what great things would happen in their life, it couldn't pull them away from, I guess, the sadness and the struggles that they were dealing with inside of their head. Mm. Yeah, it's that is a tricky one. Well, that's it. When they, it's either they don't want to talk, or they don't know how to talk, or you know, it might be a bit of the shame factor involved, and you know, and there's yeah. so many variables, you know, brother. And then also, there's a thing where people can also talk, but then still go and do it, go and do it regardless. Hundred percent. Which, which is. I watched a long time ago. I watched a documentary. I think it's called The Bridge. It's about San San Francisco, and people jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and the different stories of people, oh. um, the different people's life path, their decisions, their struggles, jobs, their their so forth, and everyone in their family tells different stories on people. Some of them had like nothing going on. They never told anyone anything. They literally just got out of their car, walked over the thing and jumped off. Far and out. there's other people that are walking back and forth and all sorts. Pretty crazy doco. Came out a long time ago. And I remember watching that a long time ago and I was like, that's the thing with suicide is everyone has their different reasons, their different sadness, their different struggles, their different addictions, their different al- alcoholism problems. And maybe different family dynamics that fall down that also can change. Like some friends of mine have had breakups and so forth and gone and taken their own life. And it's like for me or for someone that has maybe, maybe I'm a little bit stronger mentally or there's something, maybe a different chemical imbalance with certain people. But maybe they take like a breakup ten times worse than other people. Yeah, and that's the only they don't think things are ever going to get better, and it's it's so sad because all the all the maybe different women or or men they could meet in the future might have changed their life and made their life so much better. Like I know for me, I've gone through really bad relationships where it's been a toxic mess. But then my current girlfriend is like the most chill human ever and brings utter peace to my madness. So I always think where friends have taken their lives over relationship breakdowns and stuff like that, I'm like, man, you could have met someone that's going to change your life, you know, because one, one, the next day or the next job or the next person that comes into your life or whatever can make such a defining impact and change everything for so much better. And it's, 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 it's sad because people won't ever get to, to, to find that person or find that career or find that band or write that song or all these things again. It's, it's true because it can be that little thing that some comes across someone's life or it can be bang and it can bring them out of a hole. Or worse, you know, because humans are so complex and you've touched on it there and just, you know, you've got the chemical indifferences and how we're balanced out differently because you take, some person takes it like this, but then the other person takes that news like this and there's different levels within themselves and how they deal with it. And it's just unfortunate when people can't find that, that light that can then trigger them to get on a positive path and trying to, you know, still keep breathing the next day, but it's just unfortunate when it doesn't have, happen for some. Yeah, and and I had a dark like that 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 uh, the six months where Hoppo from miles away took his own life, and then Sean's called me and talking about the talking about it, and then I had the same conversation. I had conversations with friends saying about how worried I was about Sean. And I was calling him all the time and trying to just get him in a better light. But he was like, fuck, I work, I this, I that. And it was only so much I could do chatting to him. Um, And then once he'd taken his own life, then a worker at my work came up and gave me an aerodyne fender base and goes, 
I bought this because I was a fan of these nuts and a fan of Sean, and I bought this base because Sean used it. And he goes, I'm going to give it to you. Gave it to me, and he took his own life only a few months later as well. Far out. Um, and that, that was, uh, I feel like, a bit of a relationship breakdown situation, new father, and he was struggling in his own way, but just a different way to my other friends who were also struggling and also took their, took their lives in very similar circumstances. Yeah, and just listening out there, people, like there's a lot of resources, whether that's, you know, stuff you're tapping through, you know, social media, there's numbers you can ring, but remember your, you know, whether it's family, close friends, there's so many benefits out there if it can help drag you out of some sort of murky situation. So, man, dark, dark, dark. Always, always talking to your friends is such a bonus. Um but I, I actually have this thing where I want to become somewhat of a spokesperson where I can go and do, like, a, a venue somewhere where everyone sits down. I can talk to them about the struggles, the highs and lows of music, May, maybe how I have felt that, that being straight edge has helped me and my own mental health problems. I've kind of stayed away from... Uh, I've gone to therapists and stuff, but never went towards the antidepressants and stuff like they said. And that's, that's something, that's for me. That does, doesn't work for everyone else. So everyone's everyone's uh, path and what they do and how they do it is probably going to, is what's best for them. But it's like keeping in such a good headspace, positive, being around good people and trying to live a pretty healthy and positive lifestyle has helped me immensely when I have been through pretty dark, sad situations. Like a breakup with the child, with my child's mother and my father dying of cancer only a few months later was the darkest point of my life. And, and trust me, I considered a lot of fucking bad shit. Mm. Like I was, I was constantly thinking oh, well, this isn't worth it. It's not worth even getting out of bed. Oh, if if this, this, and this happened, it's probably going to be better. And then I was like, no, me not being around and not being a good parent and not being there for my daughter isn't going to give her the best life. Me being who I am, being a, 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 what, what I think is a good father, there for my child, taking her on these adventures all over the world and being the best dad I possibly can is creating the best life and best little human I can into being an adult where she goes, fuck, I had a real good dad and I had a real good life. She wouldn't have that if I took my own life when I was no. thinking all the things she was thinking. And um, you know what? When Sean took his life, when Hoppo took his life, when Duff the Tattooers took his life and my auntie died and all these things happened over the space of one year, Kennedy was the biggest saviour of it all to be there for me and just hold my hand, cuddle me and say things like that, it's going to be okay. And she doesn't realise she's the biggest, not only vehicle to drive my life as far as I do everything for her, but the biggest saviour for me and my mental health because she also creates peace in my chaos. Yeah, that's awesome, and she will realise even because how what how old is she now, the youngster? Eleven, Eleven but mate, she, she's she, going on twenty five. <laughs> that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome. So, tours. When you're looking at, like, it's what you love doing. It's fun. It's great. You're bringing music to the masses and just want to say just before i get into that i want to tap back into what we're talking about when it's got to do with depression and dark places just the amount of music and people don't get it when i talk to them about this but how much heavy music helps me like when i'm feeling in a certain space and i'm like and i'll put this music on and how it feels like it drags me out of the hole and they're like, how the fuck does, and I'm like, it sounds like this. And I'm like, 
No, you know, I try to explain it, but people just don't get it. But, you know, I listen to it for not just for that. It just makes me feel like there's all sorts of fucking emotions when it's getting me hyped to the downs and lows and the in-betweens. And, you know, I'll be listening to that stuff when I'm in my grave, I tell you. So, but, yeah, it's yeah, done a lot for I'm me. The same. I'm the same. I listen to certain old songs kind of to pull me out of, like, certain... Uh, dark spots where I'm just overthinking and whatever else. I have ADHD so bad mm. that I do overthink a lot. So when I listen to certain old songs, it takes me back to a part of my life where things weren't as kind of difficult, you know? Yeah, see? Like, I, I, I say with life, for me, it's like my businesses are very successful and life's very good, but at the same time, money more, more money, more problems becomes also an issue where I overthink 100%. everything and I second guess what I'm doing going forward where I'm like business decisions and so forth and then I go, hey, if I go back to listen to Bad Religion, Pennywise No Effects, Blink 182 Nose for a Name, all these bands it will take me back to being 14 years old where the only thing I had to worry about was playing footy and going for a surf Fuck yeah <laughs> Spot on, yeah, man. So, and it's funny how you, you try and explain that, and when they do listen to that music, it's like, how the fuck do those lyrics of that type? But you can't understand them, and it's like, just go away. You don't get it, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, look at more money, more problems. So, when you're trying to forecast a tour, so you're looking at, you know, because you're a seasoned veteran now. So, when you're sitting there and you're like, right, confession, or you're looking at whether it's doing a bit if it's overseas or regional australia so if you're like right if we're gonna break even like we we want to get the music out it means a lot to us to the people this is coming out so like how does that come about and how do you look at that so when you're like okay well this these are the venues we're looking at this is amount of numbers per people per venue ticket sales well this is a merch and then everything in in between like do you get pretty heavily involved in that and like when you're trying to forecast yeah yeah when it comes to confession i book everything with usually a person to help and then i kind of bankroll everything myself and then try and pay myself back like because we've only done bits and pieces here and there the financial reward has been more than usual because we're not on tour we're not having to spend a lot of money on food every day basically fly in fly out play some shows and and that's that's it that's it you know so for for me now it's more so as long as everything's paid for i'm pretty stoked um if i make a bit of money i'll put it away or like we did some shows made a bit of money and i went to you took canada to europe with the money Okay. Like, so just and then when we did like a show in Melbourne a few years ago, I took Kennedy to America after that and did a trip with her there. Like it's, I kind of feel like, and she comes, she came with me to do Sydney and Newcastle and stuff, and got to see it and came to the Perth show. So can see some shows now, which is cool. She likes Dad's band or what? I uh, does not. Does not like Dad's band. <laughs> Joy's watching watching me and the show because she thinks it's hilarious that people sing along and go crazy, but hates the music. Right, mate. She'll turn one. She'll turn one day, brother. She'll be right. Well, she did. She did a Sheen order the other day, and it was all like very like black, like skulls and stuff on shirts. I was like. What is she buying Parkway merch from 2005? <laughs> like, it looked like merch from, like, that Bring Me Prom Queen or Parkway would have had, like, 15 years ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, hey, so with the whole merch ordeal, right, or when you're looking at the impact that merch can make or impact earnings and on bands because I've seen like this is within the last few months like looking in some of the media around like Alpha Wolf and getting fucked over at venues and going to d different venues different rules what people make up for merch and how 
much the venue gets and getting disgruntled. So does merch make a pretty big impact on the road when it's got to go with the dollars going back into the band's pockets? And is there a lot of mucking around with venues? Like, what's the go? Um, we we never used to notice it as much. And we never used to sell enough in America to really, because we're always a support band or playing early, it wasn't a big deal. But then when we did the big venues and we'd be like, say you're doing ten to forty thousand dollars a night in merch because at any 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 time that kind of thing is possible on a big show, we'd be like, Oh, we've done five grand and just give them a small car. So it's always like thinking the best way to lie, you know? And I think bands are still pretty uh good at lying. I hope. Because you don't want to give a venue all your fucking money. They make no. enough off the bar, and and they rent the and you rent the venue off them. <laughs> yeah, bizarre. It's... bizarre. It, I hate. I fucking hate it. I fucking hate venues. Like literally, every venue can get fucked except for Trad at Crowbar and Destroy Lions, um, uh, whatever their one is, uh, what, uh, whatever their Melbourne venue is. And Brightside and, and Brisbane's good. Like the rest of the venues, like those bigger ones, like we did Manning Bar. Yeah. Recently, they charge way too much. Like just crazy. Like some venues are just want to bleed every band dry, and there's not as much money to go around anymore. So vans are more expensive, fuels are mm. more expensive, flight flights are more expensive than ever. Like make your money off the piss, like always, and greedy hands away yeah 100 percent. and you know because you guys are you know it does cost money you just knocked it on the head with travel which is huge when you guys are getting it to these places but you know you think especially post covid they should be dragging you guys in you know and trying to work with you is not against you but so so right that's it merch but australian bands Mate, the current Australian music scene, like it's healthy, you're looking at, and like your involvement there with Parkway, and it's funny because watching their DVDs and that over the years and seeing you pop in, because don't you have a Parkway bloody tattoo on your thigh or some shit, yeah? Yeah, I lost I lost rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> the band had been a band for about a year, and I lost rock, paper, scissors and I had to go get it done. <laughs> Well, mate, you got to do what you got to do, man. But um, yeah, yeah. So, how do you fit like pumped on like looking at where you've come from, what you've done, what you're doing, and then growing up with Parkway, being up in Byron, and seeing where these guys are going. And I'm glad when you back it earlier when we're talking in the podcast when it's you're talking about you know us and Parkway, where trying to book in shows with it, in each other, you know, high tide raises or ships. And now you're looking at Parkway with that, I think it's Monsters of Oz tour, where they're taking, you know, Amity Affliction, you know, North Lane, make them suffer, like, and all Australian bands that are killing it, you know, and, and like, and there's a host of others, like, you got yourself, like, Die Art, you got, man, they're all popping up left, right, and centre. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And how does that look to you and how do you feel about it, brother? I think the fact that, Parkway brought all those bands up like that because of Parkway Drive's success. All those bands are able to like succeed and have a platform and a tour, like tours that they probably never would have got without the success of Parkway Drive. Um, like Die Art took Parkway out on so many tours to boost them up. Now they'll take out bands like Make Them Suffer. Um, they've taken out North Lane a bunch. I I know for I know that they're, they've talked about. I've talked about um Alpha Wolf at Winston a bunch. So that that's obviously probably something on the cards for the future. So like all these bands, it's literally that's the high tide raises all ships situ- situation. Where the only thing I wish bands would maybe would do a bit more is. G each other up a bit more on social media. Mm-hmm. It's like 
what what I see and like bands don't do this, but what who does it and who does it well is she, females and blokes with OnlyFans <laughs> literally are always posting each other and sharing each other's shit. What? Like geeing each other up. Yeah, because they know that they're making more of an income for each other. And if they share that person and they share thing, they're probably to like a whole new demographic of people that didn't know who that person was. So like when there's that much money being made probably by them, they keep reposting. I see like people are people like I know that have it and stuff, always posting other people. So that's a t- situation of high tide raises all ships, helping each other make bang. And I think I feel like it's pretty genius. Like because it, everyone's out to everyone's out to do well, make a make a dollar in whatever business you're doing and whatever life life you choose. But I think it's real good to see when people promote other bands or promote other artists or comedians promoting other comedians or even only fans people promoting each other because i'm always a big thing for support my mates businesses promote my mate businesses my mates bands or whatever else um help helps everyone 100 percent, and you know and talking about helps everyone i'm glad joy's not a subby anymore and where that got revealed on that four corners, that was pretty brave shit with the Parkway boys and just really opening up to who they are and stoked on that. So, and going high tide raises or ships and the business of, of it all and looking at business, man, you, fu- you are flat out. So you're a busy man. You're, you know, always got your finger in the pie when it's got to do with music, but studio. When it comes to tattoo studio, barber shop, and just family man. So, what's that like? Just being amongst all that and running all that, and just yeah, how's it going? Um, yeah, so I've got three shops at the moment. Oh Jesus, <laughs> doing well. Um, I'm, I'm literally after this, I'm going to go paint the roof of a new one or the ceiling. So that's my next. So I'm painting a shop at the moment. I'm a tight ass, so I won't pay a painter. I'll do it myself. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And I've painted every job, done majority of the work myself, so I'll continue to do it that way and save save money when I, where I can. Um, and then so once that one's open, it'll be number four and just cruising, literally. So juggle, juggle picking. Uh, my days get shortened because Kennedy has – to be picked up at two fifty three o'clock every day, saying I've got to get into school at eight eight thirty. So my day's real shorter the four weeks that she's with me. So school holidays about to start, so she'll be back with me next week. Paintbrush in her hand, and she'll be fucking painting, earning, earning her keep, and bloody wins that. Wins that she's overworked. <laughs> you know, Kenny, that's how your school holidays are going to be spent. That's no, no, awesome. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make deals with her where we do some work and then we go bowling or go go karts or go ride dirt bikes or whatever we do. Um, so and maybe go 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 away in a hotel for a few days. So, do something cool. Yeah, that's awesome, brother. That's awesome. So, right, I. Favourite Aussie metal band? Parkway Drive. Yeah, I knew that was a no-brainer. <laughs> Favourite overseas metal band? Uh, ooh. I'd say Slipknot. Boom. Fuck, I've got that tattooed on me, that logo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm looking at the clown's drumstick just up in front of me now. I've got that up on the wall, love and shit. Well... That's that's the craziest thing on the say goodbye to her. V Man was our oh uh, what drinks drinks tech slash guitar tech because Brim of the Horizon fired him about three days in because he was too pissed. No so way. Hung with, hung with us the whole time and just got drunk and basically and like you can watch out the old prom queen DVDs on it. In the fucking van and shit, <laughs> and, and then so like I know I know V Man because he was on tour with the Architects and 
on tour with different bands and we've stayed friends over the years. And I remember when the architects told me V-Man's in Slipknot and I was like, this is an English joke and you're taking the piss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I remember um, Tom and Dan were like, no, he's in Slipknot. And then they showed me the clip and it was his fucking sleeve and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I had to message him and I was like, is this true? And he's like, somehow it is. Mind blown. God. So above, even after that, I had such a like warm feeling for the band because mm. they could have got fucking anyone, and they got some dude that didn't play bass that played guitar in an English band and happened to be guitar tech for a bunch of bands that they were friends with. Fuck, that's crazy, man. Hey, and I'll, that's the craziest mosh pit that I've ever been in was a Slipknot one back before I was in a wheelchair. This is. Back in 2004, I was 19, Horden Pavilion, hate, hate breed with a support act. I was up the fucking front. I eat duality or whatever. It's when um, Subliminal Verses come out. And when I jumped up, I'm up the front and the whole crowd condensed and my feet, I was stuck. My fucking feet were off the ground by like a foot oh. and, and I couldn't move. Like it just crammed in that oh. much. Yeah. And oh. I've been in plenty of pits and that was, it just made me feel Let so me much. Yeah, that's right. For like 30 seconds. And then I dropped it. I'm like, I got it back out. Yeah, this is too much, man. Like, what, um, if you don't mind me asking, what happened to you since we had the conversation? Yes. So what happened to me? So when I was 25, on my birthday, like jumped into a pool, so I was it was about one point eight the height. So I dove into a pool, something I've done plenty of times, but misjudged it and sort of jumped in and didn't sort of skim, but sort of landed in a weird way. It was sort of belly flop, sort of not really a yeah. dive, and my neck creased back, and the vertebrae, yeah, and the vertebrae pinched on the spinal cord which starved all the oxygen yeah. off to me body, brother. And and then that's when um, you, it's full on. Do you, do, you have, do you have movement in your fingers? Yeah, so I'm, so I'm classed as an incomplete quadriplegic. So because my yeah, spinal cord... that's, that's same, same as Ryan. Yeah, so my spinal cord wasn't fully severed. So I'm at the physical movement, like movement level as a um c5 c6 quad and i'm in an electric chair but i'm lucky i've got enough like got sensation so the only thing i can't feel is my right leg which is weird so um yeah it's just weird is, is have you have you looked into the stem cells and the possible stuff for the future yeah i, I do all the time yeah i have and i'm like hey elon musk fucking hurry up with your billions of dollars and get that neuro link up and running <laughs> yeah, yeah, fully. Yeah, me and, me and Ryan have talked about it in the past, where uh, he's got like um, the blood from the umbilical cord of his ba baby's birth. Yeah, all these things were, and uh, he's got a lot of stuff like that he he's read up on. But yeah, every now and again, when I'll be watching a podcast and read or read, read into something, I'll be mm. messaging him going. What about this? Yeah, like, that's awesome. The possibilities. That's the thing. It's possibilities. And the thing is, I don't – because you've got some people that they think there's going to be a kill tomorrow. But I'm like, from my perspective, everybody's different. But I'm like, there's hope but no guarantee until something's mm. ironed out. And then they're like, right now they've got this quadriplegic, paraplegic – they're up and walking or they've got some sort of mobility or function back. That's great. So I'll back it all when it comes out, and obviously that it's got to go through trials and studies, and because it's got to be, you know, safe procedures, and they'll do, you know, all the trial tests. And there's people going. Oh, Me 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 Mexico says otherwise. Oh fuck, dude! <laughs> <laughs> you, you be able to, you be able to, probably ten years, you'll be able to get a new new spinal cord new teeth and a hair transplant from Turkey as a package. Yeah, right. I might as well get some fucking new lungs too because they're, they're half shot at the moment. <laughs> oh, can I? I probably need them too with my asthma. <laughs> probably, probably could do with some new teeth as well. Fucking whatever other, what other fixes I can get.
Oh, man, you got to take it when it pops up. But, hey, give us a fact that people don't know about Michael Crafter. A fact? Yes. Or, actually, here's one I told my missus the other day. <laughs> I get super emotional in sporting movie wins. When there's a sports movie and there's, like, some triumph, I get super emotional. I watched that, like, Ride Like a Girl movie uh, yeah. about, like, Michelle Payne. And I just got emotional through the end of it. I was like, what a fucking legend. I was like, she nearly died. Blah, blah, blah. Like, good on her and her fucking brother. Good movie. It's fucking yeah, awesome. So I, I, get, I get emotional in movies. And it started from E.T., the BMX movie Rad. Yep, with ya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Fucking okay, hell, there we go. You hear that, people? <laughs> you want to get the guy in tears or emotional up and down, just send him that DVD. Oh, well, not even DVD. Advice to a streaming service. Yeah, can't go to a sports movie at the movies because, in case, I'll, I'll, I'll start crying. Crying, throwing popcorn at the screen, all sorts yeah, of shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I saw. Did you listen to Jonah's recent podcast? And, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, my good mates. Yeah, yeah. What did you think of that? Yeah, Jonah's like I've got such a well-spoken person, and I think the when he got um, out 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 of Premier Horizon. It, it, it changed him a lot because those kinds of things are very deflating on an ego. Mm. And I feel like for me, I was very egotistical myself at times where there were things that brought me back, brought me back level. And what for me was the massive change, and I know it's been a big change for him, is becoming a parent. And me and Jonah are closer than we've ever been. That's awesome. Like, we, we caught up when I was in the States. He came out here just before COVID started, so he probably brought COVID to Australia. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Jana. But, yeah, yeah, so those those things humble you because it hurts. It hurts you emotionally. It hurts you, your ego, and, it cha- and it's a big change and shift in your life. So his, him talking about it is and being open about it, mm. is, it, it it's clear you can tell that, uh, the the effect it's had on his life and but you know what like every door closes another door opens and maybe if I wasn't kicked out of I killed the prom queen and whatever else I wouldn't have met the mother of my child and I wouldn't be in Perth and I wouldn't have all the businesses I have and the life that I love and every everything has its um every negative reaction has a positive reaction also because life can change so fucking fast if you stay positive even when things are down 100 well, percent. was like it was like myself man you know when i was you know working for a tier one construction company i you know, bought first house all this is happening with my wife and i and and then fucking it felt like a nuclear bomb hit when i end up you know breaking the neck and but you know that was you know, it took me nine nine months to get out of the hospital system and get back home, but then it was back to work, like, what was it, 12, 14, 13 months later from injury. So, and it's, you know, life's, no matter if you're in a chair, you're able-bodied, whatever the situation is, life's a fucking roller coaster, man. So, but it is what it is. And it's, I'm stoked to hear that you two guys and, you know, family and everything's um, brought his closer and thanks Jada for bringing COVID to Australia and shit and um... yeah, it, was, it was cool because my child and his child have hung out in Australia they've hung oh, out in okay. and it's like a cool thing to see like we were two kids that grew up in a small town that found each other through music at school and now we've lived this very very different lives but very like parallel so to speak because We've had different successes in different bands at different times, but ridden a very much different roller coaster. 
100%. So we get, brother, we're going to finish up on three photos, and I want you to explain each. But before we get in in on them, any advice for any up and coming bands? I think um, my biggest advice, not only for up and coming bands and thing, I think it's just about the mental health side of things. I'm like, don't be scared to reach out to people and be there for your friends on tour and just support each other because you're all in this rise and then there is a fall of it that comes with every, because everything that goes up must come down. So I always think with every band, it's just have fucking fun and enjoy the ride because it, it, it can all go away very fucking fast. So it's like why it's there, appreciate it for every fucking second. Every time you walk on stage, walk off, hug your fucking friends and tell them you fucking love them and how great the show was and appreciate every fucking moment of that. Fucking preach, sir. That's awesome. Righto. Stand by. Got, got these pics coming up. Tell us what's up. Okay, righto. Where are we? Share screen. She's coming. Boom. Explain what's going on here. Is that, it didn't come up. No, you can't see it? I can't see it. No. Right, I hold on, stand by. It's saying it, sharing it. Oh, yeah. Yep. You can see it or no? Yeah, yeah, I did then. Me, me and JJ. You and JJ explain what's going on in that, that photo. That's a pretty serious face. Is there. It looks like there's there's a glass in JJ's hand. It's like a, a bit of a cheese moment. Maybe there's some solid decisions being made. We've had a chat about band, past, present, and future. My band, his band, and maybe an old band. Um, but, yeah, I just went to Melbourne to see him. I hadn't seen him in a while. Figured it real bad was going to be there too. I wanted to see Alpha Wolf. So I flew over without trying to tell anyone and got to catch up with a bunch of friends and felt that, that, Maybe in the future, prom queen playing could be possible. Hear that, peeps. And we also, we also hadn't got to be around each other much. Like we, we had the only time we'd seen each other was for Sean's funeral and stuff, and very hard place to even talk, you know. So it was good just to sit with each other, hang out, talk some shit, and maybe in the future talk some more about maybe playing a show or two. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Next, next pick. Bro, what is going on here, bros? Oh, this is the best. So I was at a, a, a cuddly animal farm with my child, and, <laughs> well, my, with Kennedy and Phoenix, my uh, partner Kate's little boy, and we were walking and this chicken was following me. So I was like, little cunt, if you're going to follow me, I'm picking you up. <laughs> so I picked up the chicken and walked around with it for about fucking 10 minutes. And I was like, fucking chickens are sick. It's such a legend. I was scratching its head and all sorts. <laughs> Did it follow you in the car? Did it want to go home? No, I, I would have been, Kate's like, you'd take this home if you could. And I was like, 100%. <laughs> like, need to buy a farm. I was like, i to have chicken friends. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, uh. Last pick here. You and the youngster in thought. Where are you? So what's going on? Uh, Austria, um, the bottom of a mountain. So we'd been in Europe for three weeks at that point, And other than the mountains, it hadn't snowed, which we were mind blown by because the middle of winter in Europe should be covered in snow. Um, that's the day we're flying out. And it's pit pours down with snow. So we got out to take a bit of a photo and then got in a car for a five hour drive to take the long take the long way home, so to speak. Yeah, right. And was that Kennedy's first time like in a, with the snow, like a snow environment? Yeah, yeah. So so then the first day we went up to so we we're in uh, Interlaken in Switzerland where they have that metal festival Greenfields. 
Um, and, and we went to a mountain called Grindelwald and she started snowboard lessons. So we spent um, most of the time on top of the mountains and she she learned how to snowboard while we there. Awesome. Right. That's it. Carbon Dev. Brother. No. Really appreciate the time for you no. to come on and, you know, just to – that's why I love having these discussions. It's like, you know, just – because a story like yours, you can't bloody compartmentalise that in 20 minutes, man. So it's... No, no. Appreciate you just, like, letting it, you know, and I can... Mate, and just how honest you are, I really appreciate that too. And, no, thanks, yeah, especially when things come close to home and nerves hit and, you know, talking about, you know, the dark situations but the light situations too. And, and that's, you know, that stuff resonates with me and also a lot of listeners and viewers out there, so... Thank you very much for that. And, um, mate, if people want to get in contact with you, throw out your details of the atmosphere with social media or if it's your shop, tattoo. I think, up, I think it's just Crafter 618 pretty much on everything. Um, and then the shops against the grain, Perth or whatever, you type it into Instagram or whatever and you'll find it. Um but yeah, hopefully do some band shit maybe in the future. Confession Saturday night of this next year, March twenty three, uh, which is Kennedy's birthday, and I have a song for falls on a Saturday, so I may do a show somewhere. Fuck yeah! I'm 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 umming and ahhing it about the possibilities, but I figure if I can play Melbourne again on a Saturday night. And it'd be March 23, then it'll be pretty fitting. Fuck, I might look at flying down for that one. Yeah, so something. And, uh, like, we got to do a couple of couple of Prom Queen songs in the past, but I feel like there's so much good confession stuff that we didn't get to play as well. So a good, a, a good uh, maybe a bunch of the old songs that I haven't seen the, seen a set for a long time and... That's it. Just a healthy mix. Yeah. Yeah. Always good. But yeah, hopefully, I, I do want to work on maybe doing a bit of spoke, spoken word kind of stuff. So it might tie in for that that date and maybe do something on the Friday night in a smaller venue, all seated. Maybe I speak, Jimmy from Chase and Go speak, and maybe someone else in the music industry talk about their path and, and their way they got to where they did. 100%. No. Well, you know, you hear that, peeps. You hear his details and just a mission that he's on and hopefully March 2020, 20, bloody four, you know. Yeah, yeah, we'll be looking at a confession show maybe on the East Coast or who knows where. But, again, appreciate your time, brother. And um, look, look forward to seeing Confession and everything else that you're going to embark on. See you, bud. Thanks, mate. I appreciate it so much. Awesome. Thanks. Right. Sick. Yeah, solid yarn, eh? I was stoked on that. Great dude. Good insight. Just seeing what band life's like from his perspective and the facets of it so much going on and just the power of music man like I know what it does for me and for others and where sometimes people don't get it like I said in the podcast where you got all these harsh vocals but for, you know for me and I know for plenty of others out there when it's got the lyrics the tone, the guitars, the drums, the ho whole kit and caboodle. How that drives emotions. Powerful stuff, man. And can't wait to see that fella back up on stage again, ripping it. And it sounds like he'll end up bloody franchising soon. The rate that he's pumping out these tattoo and bow shops. Far out. Keep it up, son. Going solid. Loved it. And if you like the podcast, hit that subscribe or follow button.
and we've also got a Patreon page. The link is within the description. So if you want to roll with the squad and become a patron, that'd be great. And if you want to get in contact with me, you can get me via Instagram at Street Rolling Cheetah or email one word Street Rolling Cheetah at gmail.com. And we've also got a Facebook page, Keep Rolling with Jake Briggs. So check it out. You can get me on LinkedIn too, just Jake Briggs. And want to thank our sponsors, Permobil Australia, the greatest electric wheelchairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four wheels right here, and they've got great assistive tech also. So, Ryder, we'll see you on the next one.